Добрый вечер! Я говорю медленно и плохо по-русски. So the rest of the evening you have to put up with the po-английски. So I apologize for that. Also, if you were expecting Bono tonight, I'm sorry he went away uh, and so he's not coming and you have to put up with me. Uh, so uh, another, I hope not too much of a disappointment. I'm going to try to give you a sense of what's happened to the internet. Many of you, maybe all of you are part of it. It's an evolving system. I'm also going to try to underscore the role of the academic community in Russia uh, in introducing the internet uh, into uh, this part of the world. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about the project to extend the operation of the internet across the solar system. So let me start by going back into the past, 40 years ago. I was a graduate student at UCLA, and I was responsible for writing software to connect a machine called the Sigma 7 to the first node of a network called the ARPANET. It was built for the American Defense Department, and it was an experiment in the kind of uh, technology called packet switching. At the time, in 1969, people thought that packet switching was crazy. It was an idea that didn't work the way the telephone system did. And in fact, the telephone companies in the United States said they weren't interested in this silly idea. But they would be happy to lease connections, telephone circuits, so we could build this network called the ARPANET. Well, the Sigma 7 machine is in a museum now. Some people think I should be there along with it. But uh, I'm still here. The network was built to explore how to share computing resources in a network among a lot of different universities who were participating in this project. If we fast forward, to 1999, this is what the network looked like. It had expanded by many orders of magnitude. The colors here are different independent network operators. So the internet is a network of networks linking literally hundreds of thousands of networks together. It's completely decentralized. Each of the different autonomous systems is operated by a different organization. There's no central authority. There's no one forcing them to connect to each other. It's a big collaboration. And in, if there's any theme about the internet that I can give to you tonight, it's about people collaborating with each other, cooperating with each other, in order to make the system grow and to add new services to it. So this is the story of a global collaboration that grew over time. You can see here that a large number of computers has been added to the network over the years. There are over 750 million machines that are on the internet today. And those are the only, only the ones that we can actually see on the public network. In fact, there are more computers than this, but many of them are hiding behind firewalls. Some of them are only connected to the net part of the time, like a laptop or a desktop that's connected for a while and disconnects. It's, it's not part of this count. So the 750 million machines is a low estimate of the number of machines on the net. In fact, the number of users on the network is nearly 2 billion. But there's something else on this picture that's equally important, and that's down at the bottom, the number of mobiles 
that have entered into the telecommunications environment, four and a half billion mobiles are in use. More mobiles than there are computers on the network. That's important to the internet because a lot of those mobiles have been internet enabled. And in many parts of the world, the mobile may be the first way that some people get access to the internet. So for companies like Google that are trying to offer services to everyone on the internet, they may need to figure out how to deliver the services through a mobile with a small screen, a tiny little keyboard, and also a large screen on a, on a PC or a laptop. So it's a big challenge to include in the application space people on mobiles as well as people who have larger computers and larger displays. Here's where the people are. If I were, had been talking to you 10 years ago, the largest population on the internet would have been in North America. But as you see, it's the third on the list now. In fact, the largest population on the net is in Asia. And that includes India, China, Indonesia, Malaysia. Almost over 800 million people in Asia are on the internet. Half of those people are in China. Half of them, 400 million people. So, and you notice that the penetration of the population is fairly low, only 20%. So when the population of Asia is online at the same percentage as you are here, about 44%, or as we are in the United States at about 75%, the number of Asians on the network will outnumber everyone. This is important if you're thinking about businesses on the internet and you're thinking about offering services on a global scale because those people have cultures, languages, and interests that are specific to their region of the world. You have to cater to that community if you want your product or service to be global in scope. Europe is the next largest grouping, but I've given up making any predictions about Europe because they keep adding countries. So the definition of Europe keeps changing. So I'm not making any predictions, just saying that they are on the average almost 60% penetrated. The rest of the countries are as you see, Africa has a billion people on the continent, but only about 100 million of them are on the internet. More people in Africa are, have mobiles, probably about 200 million, than have access to the internet through laptops and desktops, but that is improving too. Whoops, let's go back. Here we go. So I got very interested in seeing how the internet had grown over the last 10 years in this part of the world, just sort of surrounding the Black Sea. So I got some data from an organization called Internet World Stat Stats, Internet World Statistics. And what they show is that the average penetration in the Black Sea region is somewhere between 20 and 40%. Here it's about 44%, which is up quite a bit uh, from the past. In fact, if we look at, uh, at the growth rate over a period of, of time, you can see that the growth here has been almost 80%. Some parts of the world have grown at, at uh, over 300%, and I couldn't get it onto the chart. It was too big. But they started with a very small population. So the statistics look pretty big. So there's been healthy growth in this part of the world. Here we see uh, another uh, example. This time we're seeing the absolute population of internet users in each of these countries. And as you see, you represent absolutely the largest population of internet users uh, in this part of the world. And I'm sure that that number is going to grow over time.
Something interesting has been happening to the internet in the last few years. Lots of the domain names of the internet, things like www.google.com, have been written just in Latin characters, not in Cyrillic, not in Arabic, not in Hebrew, uh, not in Chinese or Korean. It's all Latin characters. That's changing. So in the last seven years or so, serious work has gone into introducing non-Latin character sets into the domain name system. Now, to be clear, the World Wide Web has always used what is called the Unicode system, which includes many, many languages in the world, many different character sets. But the domain name system for many years stayed with Latin characters. That's changing. And so here you see uh, some of the new top-level domains written in other character sets, including here in Russia. You now have, you've been assigned, uh, well, you actually applied for and were granted a top-level domain, RF, in Cyrillic, in addition to the RU, Russia, uh, in Latin characters. And as you see, there are others uh, that have been uh, awarded as well, and there are more coming. So these are additional characters, uh, additional top-level domains that are in the pipeline to be assigned. So over this next decade, I'm expecting to see a large number of non-Latin character set top-level domains added into the domain name system, which should make it a little more comfortable for people who don't happen to speak languages that are written easily in Latin characters. So there are a few applications that I wanted to bring up. Uh, Google Earth is a very popular application that uh, Google offers. It takes imagery from satellites and stitches them together into a globe. I think a lot of people here have probably seen Google Earth. But the question is, have you seen the other things? We also have Google Mars. We got the same inf kind of information from NASA to stitch together a globe of Mars. And you can zoom in on the planet just like you can zoom in on Earth. And we've even done this with another satellite, Google Moon. And when you zoom in on Google Moon, which I hope you will do, you will see high-resolution photographs that were taken of the people who landed on the moon and took pictures while they were there. So you should explore the moon and Mars in addition to Earth if you have a chance. We also have something called Google Sky. This takes the imagery from the Hubble Space Telescope and from other uh, either space-based or uh, Earth-based uh, astronomical telescopes and allows you to zoom outward from the Earth. Some of the pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope were taken of images that were formed 14 and a half billion years ago. So the further out that you go, the farther back in time you end up. So with Google Sky, you can zoom back to nearly the beginning of the universe, at least the part that we can see. Some of you will know that there was a period of time after the Big Bang when light couldn't penetrate at all. And then after a few hundreds of thousands of years, finally visible light uh, penetrates through, and those are the stars that we can see. Some of you may also know that there are lots of devices that are starting to show up on the internet. And I have to admit to you that it never occurred to me that anyone would want to put a picture frame on the internet or a thing that looks like a telephone, but it's really a voice over IP or a refrigerator. What could you do with a refrigerator on the internet? Well, uh, you could put a nice touch-sensitive panel on the front. Now, I don't know how it is here in Russia, 
But in America, the way families communicate with each other, they put little pieces of paper on the refrigerator with magnets, and they leave notes for each other. So now, with this internet-enabled refrigerator, we can blog to each other, we can send emails back and forth, we can do instant messages, but there might be more. Can you imagine if everything that you put inside the refrigerator had a barcode or an RFID chip, then the refrigerator could find out what it has inside. And while you're off at work or at school, the refrigerator is surfing the internet, trying to find recipes that it could make with what it has inside. So when you come home, the display has a choice of recipes that you could make from what's in the refrigerator. Now, if you're an engineer like me, you could extrapolate this idea. So maybe you're on vacation and you get an email and it's from your refrigerator. And it says, I don't know how much milk is in there now, but you put it in three weeks ago and it's going to crawl out all by itself. Or maybe you've gone shopping and while you're in the grocery store, your mobile goes off, or maybe you're at Gustanome number one. Your mobile goes off, it's the refrigerator calling. It says, don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else I need for spaghetti dinner tonight. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that our friends in Japan have done something really bad. They invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. And so you stand on the scale, and it figures out which family member you are based on your weight, and it sends that information to the doctor, and it becomes part of your medical record. That's probably okay. But the problem is that the refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> so when you come home, you see diet recipes coming up on the display, or maybe it just refuses to open because it knows you're on a diet. This is really bad. But the thing I like the most about these new things that are coming onto the net is this fellow in the Netherlands who invented an internet-enabled surfboard. I haven't met him, but I have this image in my head that he was sitting on the water, waiting for the next wave, thinking, you know, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. So he put a laptop in his surfboard, and he put a Wi-Fi server back on the beach at the rescue shack, and now he sells this as a service. So if you'd like to surf the internet while you're on the water, this is the product that you're looking for. So I mentioned that there are lots of devices coming onto the network. There are other things happening too. Sensor networks, things that are paying attention to the light levels or the temperature or the humidity are part of, these, are part of the internet now. You can put these systems onto the net. So in my house, I have a, a network like this which is sampling the temperature and the humidity and, the, and how, light is, how bright is the lights in each room of the house every five minutes. And then it stores that away uh, on a server down in my basement. Now, I'm sure you're thinking only a geek would do that, but I had an engineering thought in mind. If I have a whole year of information about how well the heating and the air conditioning system is working, at the end of the year, I can begin to uh, analyze how well the system is distributing heating and cooling. And I have real engineering data to do that. One of the rooms in the house is the wine cellar. It's very important to keep the temperature below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't remember what that is in centigrade, but it's probably about 15 or, or so centigrade. 
So in that room, I have an alarm that's set. So if the temperature goes up above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I get an SMS on my mobile saying your wine is warming up. So not too many months ago, uh, I went to visit uh, a laboratory in the middle of the United States. And just as I'm walking in the door, the mobile goes off. It's the wine cellar calling, the wine is warming up. And at the time, my wife was away on some trip, and she couldn't turn the cooling system back on. So every five minutes, for three days, I got this little SMS message saying, your wine is getting hotter. By the time I got home, the wine was at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not good, but it's okay. But I called the company that makes the system, and I said, hey, uh, do you have actuators that I can remotely control in addition to the sensors? And they said, yes. So I have a project coming up to go install the remote actuator in case the cooling system fails. I can turn it on remotely. Then I got to thinking, well, I can see if the lights have gone on in the wine cellar. So when I'm away, I can see if somebody went in there. Of course, I don't know what they did. So I thought, well, what if I put RFID chips on each bottle in the wine cellar? Then I could take an instantaneous inventory of every bottle in the cellar, and I could tell if any bottles went away without my permission. A friend of mine was helping me debug the design. And he said, this isn't going to work. You could go into the cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. So that doesn't work. Now we have to put a sensor in the cork inside the bottle to see if there's any wine left. And if you're going to do that, you might as well sample the esters. That's what makes the wine taste good and see if the bottle is ready to drink. So before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And you find out, is this the bottle that got up to 30 degrees centigrade when the cooler wasn't working? And if that's one of those bottles, you give that to a friend who doesn't know the difference. So this is a very practical thing to have in the house. In fact, we're going to see lots and lots of these sensor systems coming into operation and also connected to the network over the next decade. In the United States and in Europe, and maybe here, I don't know, there's an increased interest in devices that are on the network that you can interact with. And in particular, the devices can say something about how much electricity they're consuming. This could be important, especially if the way the power is, is charged, the amount of money that's charged for electricity, depends on the load. So if you're in the middle of a very hot uh, summer, like you were a couple of weeks ago, uh, if people are running air conditioners, that could be very expensive. Or if you're running water heaters using electricity, that can be very expensive. So the idea is to make smart devices that can take advice. For example, you might be able to say, dear water heater, please don't heat any water for the next 15 minutes because electricity is too expensive. And the water heater, if it's smart, will say, okay, I won't run the, the water heater for the next 15 minutes. That reduces your bill, but it has another good effect. The power company doesn't have to build generating capacity that isn't needed except maybe two or 3% of the time. So you make the whole power generation system more efficient. So it's called the smart grid uh, in the United States. Uh, it has other names uh, in, uh, in other parts of the world. I think the Japanese call it the smart community. But the idea is to have devices that are, are able to communicate their state. So eventually, 
we'll have to use robots like C3PO who can translate from one kind of uh, device uh, language to another kind of device language to build up this smart network. There's something else which is, has turned out to be fairly important at Google. You know that at Google, our objective is to try to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful. There are people in the world, including me, who don't happen to speak Russian, or maybe they don't happen to speak English, or they don't happen to speak Chinese or Japanese or Spanish. Google has worked very hard on automatic translation. Now, I, has, I, I was not sure I should do this because I don't know really how good our translation from Russian to English is, but I'm going to show you anyway. This is a web page that I pulled up off the net not too, not too long ago, and I gave it to our translator at Google, and this is what it translated into English from the, from the Russian. And since I don't speak Russian, I don't know how good or bad the translation is, but I think it's an important thing for us to try to do which is to help people overcome the barrier of communication just because they don't have a common language. So we're very interested in that uh, at Google. Here's another example uh, of uh, Pravda Online, and here is the translation back into English. So now I want to shift gears for a little bit and, and, and really uh, say something, how much respect I have for the academic community here in Russia. As 20 years ago, there were people in the uh, Russian academies, especially at uh, Kurchatov Institute, and in particular, uh, Alexei, uh, Alexei Platonov and Alexei Soldatov were very active at Kurchatov to help bring networking into uh, the Russian world. I think some of you know that, uh, uh, that uh, Alexei Soldatov is now the Deputy Minister of Telecommunications. Uh, Academician Velikov, who was in charge of the Kurchatov Institute, was very, very uh, instrumental and very encouraging about bringing high-speed networking into the academic community here uh, in Russia. They uh, participated in bringing up some of the earliest networking activities here in this country. In particular, for example, Glasnet, which, uh, if I remember correctly, was acquired. I think I have a little note about that. So 20 years ago were, was the kind of beginning of bringing internet capability into, uh, into Russia. Uh, in 1992, there was something called Usenet, which used the Unix, uh, Unix to Unix copy program to move electronic mail around from one institute uh, to another. And then uh, there was a, a group of, um, started by Natasha uh, Buleshova and a, a, an American, Greg Cole, uh, to build kind of friends and uh, partner social network here uh, in Russia. Cole was the, is now the director of the Center for International Networking Initiatives at the University of Tennessee. So these people went out of their way and were, I think, quite um, uh, aggressive about bringing networking into the, uh, into the country. Uh, MirNet was a very important introduction of high-speed networking here uh, in Russia. And the American National Science Foundation funded high-speed connections to go from uh, the city of Chicago in the United States uh, all the way over to uh, here to, uh, to Moscow. Uh, in 1999, uh, 10 years ago, a company called Sovam acquired Glassnet and extended its reach by a factor of two uh, in the course of that combination. And since that time, there is a network called Gloriad which is using optical fiber technology to bring much higher speeds con uh, connections around the academic uh, networking community. 
And, and in 2009, just last year, uh, Mr. Soldatov is chairing the eArena Consortium, which is linking a number of networks here with the Gloriad project, which is a global network of high-speed optical fiber for academic research. And the, the plan is to get up to over a gigabit per second of capacity for these various sites. Did I get, did I miss, let me see, whoop, wrong way. Yes, okay. Uh, so al also I understand that uh, Runet is being used to link a number of uh, universities and schools around the country at at least 128 kilobits per second and uh, preferably, uh, of course, higher if possible. And then there are commercial uh, telecom networks that are in operation. I'm sure that I don't have all the details right. So I, if some of you probably know this history better than I do, and I apologize if I left a lot out or if I said something that's not quite precise, but the point I want to make is the respect I have for the academic initiative to bring networking into the country and then later the introduction of commercially available services. Of course, you know my title at Google is Chief Internet Evangelist. My job is to try to get people to use more internet and to build more internet so that all of us can share. And this is part of the story. I think that most of you will know that uh, there is a great deal of interest in the current administration here to uh, promote the growth of high-speed networking in the telecom world, in the mobile world, uh, and also uh, in, uh, in high-speed uh, dedicated internet connections. Now, I understand that your president Medvedev is quite interested in technology like this, just like our President Obama, I think the two of them probably bonded over a couple of email exchanges with their mobiles. We understand that President Medvedev did the first video on the net here, and then uh, according to our American Forbes magazine, your president is the top blogger in Russia. I have to say it's wonderful to know that someone in such a high position has a real feeling for technology. Uh, I've experienced the opposite of that in, uh, in earlier administrations in the United States. It's not a pretty sight. Okay, so this is the Gloriad network, uh, which is connecting lots of different academic institutions in Russia with others around the world. And that's an activity which is continuing to grow. It circles the Northern Hemisphere. And now there are efforts to extend the way this Gloriad network operates uh, to go through the Middle East and Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. These are supercomputers that are linked to each other. And there are lots of applications that require not only a huge amount of computation, but also a large amount of data to go back and forth to complete the computations. So these networks are really critical. The thing that I want to emphasize here is that international cooperation is a key to progress in this area. You can't do these networks by yourself. You have to do them with other people. And so again, this is how the internet keeps growing. It's because, because of this collaboration. So now I, let me switch to the final thing that I wanted to talk to you about tonight. Uh, First of all, I want to make sure you understand that this is not a Google project. So the, the business plan at Google is not to take over the solar system or anything like that. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on since 1998 with the American uh, Space Agency, NASA. And our, our objective was to provide a richer kind of networking than has been available for the last 40 years in space exploration. In 1964, the Americans built something they called the Deep Space Network. It was a system of three 70-meter dishes at 
three places in, around the world, one in uh, Madrid in Spain, one in Canberra, Australia, and one in Goldstone, California. And as the Earth rotates, these big 70-meter dishes can look out into the solar system and communicate with spacecraft that might be in orbit around a planet or maybe landing on the surface. But it was a point-to-point -point radio link. That's a pretty weak network compared to the Internet. So my colleagues and I wanted to see what would it take to build a network like the Internet that would work across the entire solar system, linking the planets to each other. So that was the task we set ourselves over 10 years ago. We started by thinking about Mars because the spacefaring countries had been sending spacecraft to Mars since the uh, 1970s. The Americans landed uh, a spacecraft on Mars called Viking in 1976. Uh, the Russian landed spacecraft on the moon 10 years earlier in the 1960s. But these were all point-to-point -point links, so we were asking ourselves, could we do better? You'll remember that in 2004, two spacecraft landed on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity. The original plan with those rovers was to transmit data directly from the surface of Mars to Earth. The data rate that they could sustain was 28 kilobits per second, not very much. And the scientists were not too happy about the fact that it was a very low data rate. But, you know, that's all they had. So they turned the radios on, and they both, both spacecraft radios overheated. And so, of course, immediately uh, they got turned off, and the engineers said, well, we can't run them for as long as we intended because they'll overheat. So now the scientists are really unhappy because they won't get as much data back as they wanted. But an engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory said, you know, there's a radio on both of the rovers that can run at 128 kilobits per second. But it can't go all the way back to Earth. But it could reach up to orbital altitude. And it happened that there were four spacecraft in orbit around Mars. They had been put there before the rovers landed to map the surface of Mars and figure out where should the rovers go. But they finished that job. So they were reprogrammed to take data from the surface of Mars, from the rovers, and capture it in the orbital satellite. And then they would hold on to the data until the satellite got to the right place in the orbit to transmit the data back to Earth to the deep space network at 128 kilobits a second. So by reprogramming the system to do what's called store and forward communication, we got more data back than we would have gotten with the original design. Now this was a pretty uh, brave thing to do. We had to upload new software into the spacecraft, both the orbiters and the rovers, and hope that you didn't make a mistake. So this store and forward system is a form of packet switching. Packet switching is how the internet works. And so for the first time, the scientists saw the power of packet switching, the power of store and forward networking for the delivery of scientific data. They were so convinced of this new idea, at least from their point of view, new idea, that when the Phoenix lander arrived at the North Pole of Mars, it didn't have any direct path back to Earth. They assumed that they could do store and forward relay. Now, I admit to you that a three-node network is not too exciting, but it's a beginning. So my colleagues and I, years before this particular 
uh, implementation happen, started thinking, what kind of protocols would we need to build a solar system internet? We started out thinking, well, maybe we could use TCP IP that works okay on Earth, so it should work okay on Mars. Except we found out that it wouldn't. Well, actually, it works okay on Mars, and it works okay on Earth, but it doesn't work okay in between. The problem is that the distance between the planets is astronomical and the speed of light is too slow. So when you think about it, Earth and Mars are in, satellite, are in orbit around the sun. When we're closest together, we're 35 million miles. When we're farthest apart, we're 235 million miles. At the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, it takes about three and a half minutes one way to go from Earth to Mars when we're closest together. And when we're the farthest apart, it takes 20 minutes one way. The round trip time is double that, 40 minutes. Now you need to know something about the TCP IP protocols. They're very, very simple protocols. Remember, they were designed almost 40 years ago. And so the part of the design is called flow control. When you're transmitting data to somebody else and the receiver is, is keeping track of how much room do they have to store the data, when they run out of room, you send a, a message saying, stop sending, I've run out of room. Well, that works okay if the person receiving that message is a few tens or hundreds of milliseconds away, less than a second. But if it's 40 minutes round trip time, when you say stop, the other guy isn't even going to hear you for 20 minutes and is going to be sending all this data that you don't have any place to put. So flow control doesn't work. Then there's another problem. This is called celestial motion. The planets have a habit of rotating, and we haven't figured out how to stop that. And so if you're talking to something on the surface of a planet, and the planet rotates, eventually you can't talk to it anymore because it's on the wrong side of the planet. So you have to wait until it comes back around again. So our conclusion was we have variable delay, and we have disrupted communication. The TCP IP protocols were not designed to be robust in that context. So we said, okay, we have to design a whole new suite of protocols that we call delay and disruption tolerant protocols. So we did that. We've been testing them for, for the last five or six years. We've done terrestrial tests. We've done tests with the military in um, tactical communications, which is often disrupted because of jamming. We uh, got some help from our friends in Sweden, uh, the Sami, the, the reindeer herders, up in the northern part of Sweden, agreed to let us put uh, Wi-Fi servers in the villages, and the, uh, the DTN, the Delay and Disruption Tolerant Protocols, in laptops in the back of all-terrain vehicles. And so as they make their way into the village, they dump the data they have, and they take whatever data they're supposed to get, and then they wander off to another village, and they dump the data and get the data they need. And so they're like little mules carrying data from one village to another, and it works. So we've now done good terrestrial testing, we put the protocols on board the International Space Station. So they are now running between Earth and the International Space Station. A few years ago, there was a, 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 a spacecraft that was called Deep Impact. It went far away from Earth to rendezvous with a comet. And it launched a probe into the comet in order to see what the interior of the comet was made out of. 
The spacecraft that launched the probe is still operating. It's in orbit around the sun, very eccentric orbit. It comes close to Earth and goes very, very far away out to where the comets are. So we got permission from uh, the American Space Agency to upload our protocols into that spacecraft while it was about 81 light seconds away. So we've done interplanetary scale testing with that spacecraft. The spacecraft is on its way out again to rendezvous with another comet at the end of this year. And after it finishes that mission, we're going to upload our space protocols again and run some more tests between that spacecraft, uh, transceivers on Earth with the Deep Space Network and the International Space Station. And we even have an implementation that's planned on Itilsat 14, which is a, a, a satellite that's in orbit around, around the equator. We've also implemented the protocols on the Android operating system that are for mobiles. And so perhaps at the end of this year or maybe sometime early in 2011, it will be possible to send a message from your mobile all the way out to the spacecraft that's rendezvousing with a comet and come all the way back to Earth maybe by way of the International Space Station. So we're at the point now where we may be able to standardize the protocols for deep space communication. If that happens, working with the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, then all the spacefaring nations, including Russia, China, Japan, Korea, the United States, uh, the European Space Agency, if they all adopt the same protocols, all of their spacecraft will be able to communicate with each other. Just like when you plug your laptop into the internet, you can talk to 750 million other machines. So if everyone agrees to use the same interplanetary protocols, we will be able to literally grow an interplanetary backbone one mission at a time, which is what we're hoping to do. So I'm going to skip over uh, that slide. This, this is what the interplanetary system could look like 50 to 100 years from now. Every time a new mission is launched that uses the standard protocols, when it finishes doing whatever it's doing from the scientific point of view, it could be turned into a node of an interplanetary backbone. So over the course of the next several decades, you may actually see this interplanetary system growing. Now, some people have said, why would you do that? There's nobody out there to talk to. And of course, the answer is, there may not be any people out there, and we don't know about aliens, but we do know that we will keep launching spacecraft to explore the planets and their satellites around the solar system. The more of them that are out there, the more communication we're going to need. And so this interplanetary backbone will literally grow itself as we launch new missions to the outer planets. The same backbone can be used to support manned space exploration. And in fact, we're expecting to see manned and robotic uh, exploration happen together. For example, astronauts that are in orbit around Mars could be interacting with sensor networks and even rovers or robotic devices on the surface. And they need local networking to do it. That's what these protocols accomplish. Well, that is, that's all of the formal remarks that I plan to make tonight. I appreciate very much the time and trouble you've taken to come out to join us tonight. And I'm very happy uh, to, uh, to answer questions that you might have uh, on whatever I've said or other topics that come to mind. So let me say spasiba, boshoya spasiba, and we'll talk some more with Q&A. Will the moment come when we people are too dependent on the data and at the moment, on the other hand, are not capable of handling it? Thank you. Um, first of all, the answer is yes, it's possible to have too much information. And you have trouble figuring out what information is important and what is not. 
Yeah, when you do a Google search, you're searching a huge amount of information. And we try to put a rank ordering together to say what we think might be the most relevant to you, but there's a lot that you're not seeing. So the question is, uh, what can we do to help you manage this huge amount? It's not going to go away. More information is going to be coming. In a way, I wonder if we would have the same discussion in the 1500s or maybe in the 1400s. Gutenberg invents the press. And you can imagine if I were Gutenberg coming to tell you about this amazing printing press, I can print thousands and thousands of copies of these books. And you're at the microphone, the, the 15th century microphone. Uh, saying, wait a minute, that could be too much information. I couldn't read every book that was ever printed. Are you crazy? Why are you doing this to us? So uh, one response I would have to you is that you probably don't watch every movie that's made. You don't read every magazine or every book. You don't read every newspaper. So you already have evolved for yourself ways of uh, filtering which information you're interested in. Computers can help. They can't do all of the job, but they can help. We can augment our existing filters by automating some of them. But it's going to take uh, some clever software to help us figure out which information is important to each of us personally. So what's interesting to you may not be as important to me and probably different for everyone else in this room. So I'm, I'm not worried that it's going to kill us to be overloaded. We already are overloaded and we're still alive. But I think we can use computing power to help us. It's the first time in the history of the world that we've had a mechanical thing that magnifies our brain power as opposed to electrical motors that only magnified our muscle power. So I'm still optimistic that this is going to be okay. All right, let me get another question. Uh, Eric Schmidt said that uh, we're creating now more data than we created for 2,000 years of human history. And yes, we got lots of data, Internet of Things, uh, sensor networks, creating oceans of data. But uh, we are kind of a bad to, to extract knowledge from all this data, and uh, we need some kind of artificial intelligence for that. Steve Jobs said that Google's ultimate business model is to build artificial intelligence. So uh, when we can, where are, where where are, we, are we, we now? <laughs> that? So it's, it's very, um, it, I'm going to go where the light is, okay. Uh, I think it's very interesting to speculate about um, the internet suddenly waking up and becoming artificially intelligent. I don't think it's going to happen. But I do think uh, that we can um, bring computers into our environment closer than they are today. How do we interact with computers today? Mostly we type on keyboards, or we touch screen, or we have a mouse, or a trackpad. And so the computers have forced us to use ways of interacting that are not normal. They're not the way humans interact with each other. And I am now convinced that we have to bring the computers into our communication space. We have to be able to have conversations with the computers to explain what it is that we're looking for. This is not necessarily the same as a kind of giant artificial brain, but it might be an artificial partner that can communicate with us, can converse with us, and help us find the information that we want or analyze the information that we have. So I think that the path is not towards the kind of science fiction artificial intelligence where the robot suddenly wakes up and is, you know, is, is self-aware and then tries to take over the world because the humans are... Вопрос будет по платформе Android, если вы не возражаете. А вопрос такой, более конкретный, наверное. А, вот а, платформа Android, это платформа а, для мобильных устройств, есть маркет, на котором а, продаются приложения. Ну, можно выкладывать приложения платные и бесплатные, как и у Apple. Многие в курсе, наверное, да? Вот. А, 
Собственно, проблема в том, что в России почему-то сделано так, что э, нельзя покупать э, приложения платные. Можно скачивать только бесплатные приложения, вот, э, что очень сильно тормозит развитие разработок э, на этой платформе в России, потому что разработчики не могут заработать денег. Вот, э, соответственно, у меня вопрос к вам, как, поскольку вы самый крутой представитель Google, которого я встречал. Вопрос к вам, когда, когда это кончится. Вот. Да. Я понимаю, что, возможно, не по адресу немножко, но, а, но если, если а, ну и в дополнительный вопрос, вопрос, как бы вам такая в помощь вопрос, расскажите о перспективах Android на, еще, на 21 век, вот так скажем, да? Два вопроса у меня, вот, спасибо. Okay, got it. Okay, and by this Android platform, of course, you mean the software platform, not not Commander Data uh, in the Star Trek. Uh, okay, so uh, so uh, the, first of all, uh, Google is very committed to continuing to evolve the Android platform. It's open source, as you know, and the reason that it's open source and also free is that we want other people, including you, if you are interested, to help us develop new capabilities in that platform. I think also you may know that we're working on another operating system called Chrome operating system, and that too will be uh, openly available and uh, something that you can help to develop. We believe that mobiles should be allowed, or users of mobiles should be allowed to download any reasonable applications that they want. We think that the, uh, the carriers shouldn't be restricting the users about what kinds of applications they use as long as the applications are not harming the mobile network. What I'm honestly hoping uh, is that by offering these kinds of open platforms that we will continue the evolution of the internet as we have seen it over the last 20 or 30 years. The only reason you see so many interesting applications on the net is that people are free to invent new ideas and they don't have to ask permission to do that. So as an example, when uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page started Google, they didn't have to get permission from every internet service provider or every uh, mobile provider in the world, all they had to do was to get connected to the internet, build their application, and let people try it out. And we think that's the fastest way to discover new applications that are of interest to people. So I hope we can maintain that very open environment and allow many people to contribute to the growth of the network and its application space. So, uh, throughout your lecture, you've mentioned uh, the uh, high-level domain names that are not in English, uh, for example, in Russian or some other languages. But uh, don't you have uh, concerns regarding this uh, in that way that uh, uh, they can separate uh, the Internet into parts uh, that are not accessible to people uh, from other countries? And, uh, Uh, well, this may be a bad uh, thing, and this may be contrary to the idea of unification uh, of, the of all the people. Uh, okay. The introduction of the uh, non-Latin character set in the domain name world and the use of the Unicode set is intended to allow for this expression in any language in the world. Now, if you're concerned about being able to communicate with everyone, you might actually choose to register domain names in multiple scripts and different languages. And that would be, be uh, remember that any one host or any one website can be registered under multiple domain names. So you could have one in Cyrillic, you could have one in Latin characters, you could have one in Chinese and Korean, uh, catering to the local languages of the world. It's still very beneficial that many people, including many of you here, speak English, and that's become a very common language around the world. But it's not the only one. And I think the Internet needs to be open 
to every language if that's possible. So I think we get to have both the localization and also, we hope, the general uh, ability for people to use a common language. And where that doesn't work, Google and others are investing in translation. Of course, the quality varies, but I think translation is yet another way of breaking through barriers that stop people from communicating with each other. Okay, let's take a question from over here. So that's a really good question. You're quite right that the internet and the World Wide Web are two different things. The World Wide Web is right now the biggest application on the network, but there are other applications that came before the World Wide Web and there will be applications afterwards. I don't know exactly what they are, maybe you will, because there's nothing stopping people from building new applications and putting new protocols on the internet. The uh, basic protocol, the internet protocol, is accessible to anyone who connects to the internet. So if you want to build new protocols, you're free to do that. And so I f don't foresee in any detail what new applications will come along. But for example, streaming video is not the World Wide Web. Streaming video is going through the UDP protocols, for example. So there are, it's technically possible for new protocols to be developed and new applications to, to be developed that are outside of the World Wide Web. So there's no stopping us from inventing extensions well beyond those well-known applications, including things that are different from the World Wide Web. I just don't know what they are going to be. And I'm almost not worried that I don't know. The reason is, as long as the net stays open, and other people are free to introduce their new ideas, that's all I care about, that we get to capture the ideas and the skill and the expertise of everybody on the internet, even if we don't know ahead of time what they're going to do. Okay, let me take a question over here. My question is the со стороны культуры, технологий. И причем вот я бы хотел как Ну, я коротко так скажу, расспросил. Да. Будьте добры, все-таки остановитесь на вопросе ограничений на технологии со стороны культуры. И как, на ваш взгляд, вот они будут проявляться, допустим, в ближайшее время? Потому что вот книги уже показали, что культура дает очень серьезное ограничение. Спасибо. Я не знаю, что все правила здесь, в России, но я могу сказать вам, что правила здесь, в Соединенных Штатах. Когда вы покупаете книгу, у вас есть право продать книгу кому-то другому. You have the right to give the book away. You have the right to throw the book away. You have the right to loan the book to someone and get it back. Th now think about e-books. The way they're showing up right now, they show up on these little book readers like Kindle from Amazon or a Sony book reader. They don't have the same properties that the printed book does. This is because there are intellectual property rules and technology restrictions or constraints that do not give you the same rights. So when I get an e-book, I'm not able to loan it to someone else, usually. I can't sell it to someone else. Mechanically, I can't get it out of the e-book reader even to do that. So that's an example of how the new technology may actually be more constrained than the old technology was. At the same time, we see people worried about intellectual property control. Most of the intellectual property controls or copyright controls are based on keeping people from reproducing things. Well, in the paper world, it's expensive to reproduce books or to reproduce uh, CDs and things like that physically. But once things are in digital form, the World Wide Web makes it easy to distribute to copy and distribute. In fact, if you think about how a browser works, 
What does it do? It goes to a host on the internet and it copies the home page. It's a giant copying machine. And you can see why the copyright people who think copying is a bad thing are very worried about the World Wide Web. So they try to build fences around these digital objects to keep people from duplicating them. The real truth is that the technology is here to stay. You can't stop it. You have to learn how to cope with it, including changing, maybe, the way in which people are compensated for the kind of intellectual property they put in digital form. It's, if you say, it's like standing in the, on the beach and seeing a tsunami coming in saying, stop, it doesn't work. So you have to learn how to work with the digital technology. So I think that the constraints that we see today will ultimately have to be changed by clever ideas from engineers and lawyers and others who find a way to adapt intellectual property treatment in this digital environment. Let me take another question from the other side now. Many countries has their own national social networks. I've heard um, that Google start, is starting a new social network in November. Um, I have got a question. Uh, well, um, why do we need another one social network? What can it offer to us? Thank you. Okay. So, you know, in a way, social networking is just a reflection of, of human beings, right? We are very gregarious people. We like to talk to each other. We like to have meals together. We dance and we laugh and we sing and we fight. So, uh, in fact, when you think about the first big application on the network, even before internet, on the, on the ARPANET, in 1971, electronic mail gets invented and it becomes extremely popular. The first thing that happens is a distribution list for science fiction. So people who are reading science fiction stories can talk to each other about which ones they liked and which ones they didn't. And the next application after that was restaurants, reviews of which restaurants were good and bad. This is a social thing. So that all that you're seeing now with the social networks, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or instant messaging or Orkut, is a reflection of the general population wanting to use these technologies to extend their ability to interact with each other. And in some ways, this is a good thing, and in some ways, maybe not. How many times did you check your email on your mobile while I was talking? Uh, how many times do you stop talking to your friend at dinner and check to see if you had any instant messages or SMS messages? So these technologies can sometimes interfere with the human relationships that we try to establish. On the other hand, they also have the ability to maintain connections that would be difficult otherwise. So I travel a great deal around the world and I manage to stay in touch with my family and friends because we have these online systems. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced that social networking is here to stay. Okay, now I get one over here. Same. So basically, um, all our information is out there in the internet, and the end is found by Google. And they say that basically, in about five years, people will have to change their names <laughs> so that they, so that people don't find out about crazy things when, when what they did when they were young and lightheaded. So, what do you think? Where are we moving to? And will we actually have to create double personalities in order to stay clean? No. <laughs> our our uh, <clears throat> chief and, uh, executive officer. Uh, made the suggestion that maybe people should change their names when they become uh, 21 or 18 or something so that you could hide from everything you put on the net when you were not thinking carefully. I think that it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, I for a while thought that the young people, teenagers, uh, were putting things on the net that they shouldn't. And they were exposing uh, themselves to too much of the, of the general population. But a lot of the, of the uh, social networking sites actually give you some control over who is supposed to see what you put on the net. 
And a lot of the young people know how to, do, how to put those controls in, especially they don't want their parents to see their Facebook page, for example. So it may not be as bad as it sounds. Anytime you get new technologies like this, you eventually find um, people adopting social practices to somehow cope with the side effects of these kinds of new ways of interacting, new ways of sharing information. But I don't want to minimize your point about privacy. I think we don't have as much privacy as we used to. Each of you is carrying a mobile. It has a camera. It can do still pictures. It can do audio recordings. It can do uh, video. You can easily upload whatever you take onto YouTube or one of the other uh, image sharing sites. And so we have the ability as, as humans to put an awful lot of information about other people, not just ourselves. And those other people didn't give us permission to do that. So I think that we are faced with a, a considerable erosion in the expectation we have of privacy and anonymity. And this is not something that is easy to stop. I don't think writing any regulations will help. I think we have to discover our society has evolved now into one which is in some ways less private than it used to be. And I, we just have to get used to that. Okay, next question. Поэтому у меня вопрос к вам как основателю интернета. Представьте, что вот рядом с вами, вот по левую руку, стоит машина времени. Вы садитесь в нее и отправляетесь в декабрь 69 года на узел Сигма. Скажите, вы бы тогда стали изобретать интернет, зная, что произойдет дальше? Это первый вопрос. А второй, а второй вопрос, если бы стали, что бы вы изменили как инженер, как человек и как человек в этом разбирающийся сейчас? Okay, so this is a wonderful opportunity to pretend that I can go back and change history. Uh, I don't think I would change anything on that 1969 picture that I showed you. But when Bob Kahn and I started doing the design of the Internet itself, not the ARPANET, but the Internet, uh, I made a really bad mistake, uh, several bad mistakes. The worst one was in 1977. The question was, how much address space do we have to have for the Internet? And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, it's, remember, we just wrote the paper in 1973. We published the paper in 1974. I'm now in the American Defense Department running the Internet Research Program in 1977. I've just spent a year listening to the engineers and the researchers arguing with each other over how much address space does this experimental network need. We didn't even know if it was going to work. So they, some people wanted variable length addresses and the programmers didn't like that. Some people wanted 128 bit addresses. And you know, you know how many addresses 128 bits gives you? 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. And I thought, you know, you don't need that many addresses to do an experiment. 32 bits would give us 4.3 billion unique terminations in the network. I thought it was an experiment. So the problem is the experiment never ended. So here we are, it's 2010 and we're running out. So now we need to put in the 128-bit IP version 6. So if I could change anything, I would have changed that. But imagine trying to convince everybody that this experiment is going to be so successful that we need 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. Nobody would believe me. So the only other thing I would do if I had the chance, and again, this is about 1977, same, same time frame. At that time, I knew that we didn't have the technology to secure the network the way I really wanted to. There was technology available, but it was classified. It was military cryptography. It's ironic that the year that we start standardizing the internet protocols, the first public key cryptography ideas emerge out of my friends at Stanford, uh, Whit, uh, Whit Diffie and uh, Marty Hellman. 
But it was only an idea. Nobody implemented anything. So the result was there was no technology available then to implement what we know could be a more secure network today. It's not too late. We can implement those technologies now with publicly available cryptography, and that's what we should do. You know, I get the impression that it's starting to get rainy and wet and windy. Maybe we should stop. I know you all had lots of other questions, but it's late. You need to go home, and so do I. So let me thank you all again for coming tonight. I wish you well.